one of the things that's been frustrating during COVID has in fact been that those of us who are, you know, really enjoy interacting with each other have had a special trouble figuring out how to do advocacy when we can't, when we can't be around the people we're advocating with. And in a lot of cases, we can't be around people that we're advocating for. So what, what I'm going to try to do is to give you some specific pointers about creative advocacy. And I, I was kind of thinking about, I've been thinking about it for the past few days as I've had conversations with clergy and other people about how the the creative ideas that we've come up with during COVID, we shouldn't think of as being time capsules, as, as a thing that we're only going to do while it's COVID. And then when it's over, we'll just go back to how we were doing it before. People have learned to new, do new and creative things during the past year. And we should we should not let go of the things that work for us. So uh, while these are ideas that definitely will help you make your voice heard from six feet away while you're wearing a mask, they also probably will help when we're past COVID as well. So, um, so the first thing is just this basic idea of what advocacy is. And people who've seen me give a presentation on advocacy before know that I like to do a little bit of a a gotcha question where I ask if people have ever advocated against something. Of course, the, the tricky bit is we never advocate against anything. Advocacy always means to speak for something. I think it's a really good discipline um, when we're thinking about things we don't like to think in terms of what it is that we would want instead, because the way that you want things to be is what you're advocating for not the things that you don't like right now. Advocacy means using your voice to advance something you do love, that you do care about. It doesn't mean tearing down someone or something else. So policy advocacy is advocacy when we're talking about public policy issues. And it turns out that, you know, we. We all like to learn, I think, policy statistics. We like to learn, you know, no one knew what ERCOT was until a couple of weeks ago. And now suddenly a lot of Texans know this arcane acronym that was never supposed to be part of the public discourse. But those statistics and those that kind of insider facts are not really what drives policy development. What drives policy development more is the stories of real people uh, that talk about how policy really impacts them. And I'm going to ask Crystal Leedy, our, our congregation liaison, to put in the chat. Right now, we have a story collection project going on about the winter storm. So you may have seen it on social media if you're on social media. More about that in a second. Um, but we are uh, hoping that Texans will share stories of their experiences during the storm, either the experiences that they have losing power, losing water, being cold, whatever those things were, but, but also, and maybe uh, almost more important, the stories of what you did to help other people and the ways that policy helped or, or impeded your progress in doing that. Those are the kinds of stories, that's the kind of information that legislators are gonna need to know and, and lots of it and pretty quick to be able to think through the, the kind of mountain of new policy questions that have gotten dumped in their laps here with the session really almost halfway over. So when we think about advocacy and, you know, uh, constituent engagement with legislators. I want to say that I, I've been, I have been at Texas Impact for 21 years. I've been in public policy for more than 30 years. And at, with, with the weight of 30 years of experience behind me, I will say this, this screen, this is where most people kind of get it wrong. This is, this is the first place that people don't understand where they are in the process so that they can have like 
effective communication with policymakers. If you don't understand what the level of government is of the, the person or the staff that you're talking to, you'll talk to them about things that they can't really do anything about. And if you don't, if you're not clear about what the branch of government is, same thing, or you, you may actually end up being kind of counterproductive by talking to one branch of government about something where they have actual conflict with another branch. So these are the, we're lucky that we have the Brady Bunch to guide us in this exercise. There are, as you know, three levels of government, federal, state, and local. There are three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. And, and I'll just say Texas Impact mostly works in the legislative branch, a little bit in the executive, barely at all in the judicial. And we mostly work at the state level, more and more actually at the federal, but that really is dependent on what the hot issues are. Not that much at the local level, although we are certainly big fans of local government and we hope that our members are very engaged at the local level. I'll give you uh, just these two pieces of jargon that hopefully can get you through a lot of sticky situations. When we talk about the federal level and we're specifically talking about Congress, the, the legislative branch, we're talking about the Hill. And I see here I've got a typo in the word Hill. It should have two L's, but it always refers to Washington, D.C. If you don't want to sound like a, an out-of-towner, don't talk about the Capitol in Austin, Texas as the Hill. That building is referred to as the pink building by people who are, are in the know. Um, and those are the kinds of distinctions that may seem funny to you as a constituent. You may think, well, who cares about these, the, the terms of art for different things? But if you imagine from the perspective of a legislator or their staff, the, the amount of content that they have to deal with routinely, at least coming to them with the, with the right lens, the right frame for the content that you want to talk about is a really good way to get off on the right foot. So if you're talking to someone in Congress, they are either a congressperson, a congressional representative, or, or a senator. So they, Senator John Cornyn and Senator Ted Cruz are the two US senators from Texas. You're talking about someone at the state level, they are a representative, a, a legislator, or again, a senator. So uh, Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia is gonna speak to us Monday at five. She works on the Hill in the US Capitol in Congress. But before she was there, she was Senator Sylvia Garcia who worked in the pink building in the Texas legislature. So keeping those, keeping those distinctions is important. So we have been in kind of a rough period for the past year. And I mean, I, I know that I don't even have to say that. We all feel in our bones the weight of all the crises and uh, traumas that have gone on over the past year. And it starts to feel, I think for a lot of people, like this big ball of concerns, this word cloud on the, the left side of the screen. Um, you know, everything is is kind of tangled up together, right? Racism and voting and also COVID and the disproportionate impacts that COVID has had on communities of color and also low income people and jobs and wages and health care are also pressures on low income people. And, and all of that stuff gets tangled together and it's hard to think about it and it's hard, harder still to take action on it. And that's not just true for y'all, that's true for legislators as well. Um, the trick is moving your, your orientation from 
thinking about this ball of stuff as something you're worried about to thinking about it as as cogs in, in a machine, things to work on, um, gears, that each one of those issues exists separately, drives some of the other issues, is driven by some of the other issues. And if you can find points of attachment to even one of those issues, you can know that your work is moving the whole machine forward. So here we are in, in the middle of a legislative session when so far uh, Texas Impact staff, and I, I'm betting most of you haven't yet been inside the Capitol, that's a pretty surprising thing. Um, we haven't been, we haven't felt comfortable to go in. We haven't felt comfortable to have meetings with legislators. And uh, so now the legislature's meeting, committees are happening and we have to figure out some creative ways to start to have those interactions, uh, even though it's gonna be a bit before most people feel comfortable going into the legislature to testify. During a normal legislative session, we would be having capital visits. If you were attending this event last year, you know that you would have had a, an in-person visit scheduled for Tuesday. We'd be having rallies. Also, there'd be public meetings in the district. You'd be going in person to the district office of your legislator to meet with them. You'd also be doing phone calls and social media and you'd be sending regular mail probably. During this session, the for the time being, the most the the creativity we need to exercise is how to how to replace those in-person interactions, the capital visits and rallies and the district visits. We don't we we can't necessarily have the same in-person meetings, <clears throat> excuse me, in the district office, but definitely we can drop things off at a district office. And I think as people get comfortable, more and more we'll be able to sort of weave those short in-person interactions back into our activities. But I want to focus everyone's attention now on social media because social media is largely replacing those in-person interactions for the short term. And in the future, social media is going to continue to be important even when we can have in-person interactions. This is how I think of social media. It's Facebook is where your friends are. Instagram is where your children and grandchildren are. Twitter is where your legislators are. And TikTok is just a thing you should stay away from, in my experience. So I wanna think about advocacy on Facebook for a minute. Advocacy on Facebook is has to do with sharing information, sharing, events, sharing stories. It's not a good place to try to get anybody's, to change anybody's mind. Facebook, anybody who's ever participated in a, in a Facebook fight knows it's not a good place to try to change someone's mind. It's also not a great place to try to get a legislator's attention unless you have some reason that you know that that legislator is already paying attention to you on Facebook. Facebook is a good place to promote events. Probably some of you heard about this event from Facebook. It's a good place to put information about um, things that you've done. So um, a lot of people have been posting information about getting their COVID vaccination or participating in a shot clinic. It's also a good place to put information at, that you happen to get because of where you are in the moment. So um, Sarah Cruz, who's our, our immigration policy specialist and is gonna be presenting on Monday, happened to be in the Valley at a, a, an event where um, Congressman Castro spoke and she was able to get an interview with him and, and also a selfie, which maybe she'll tell you about. Um, but, but that's, a, that's good kind of information to put on Facebook. Advocacy on Instagram is more like showing 
So if Facebook is more like sharing where you might expect that people will make comments and you will comment back and then you ask questions and answer, Instagram's probably less interactive that way. Instagram is where you're showing an activity that you've done or promoting um, an event or showing some kind of example. It, it, it is not a good place to get confirmation of your impact because it's less of a back and forth communication. So these are some examples of Instagram communications. And if you're like me, um, I would not have necessarily registered for an Instagram account. I, I was doing fine with Facebook, um, but my kids don't use Facebook really at all anymore. They use Instagram almost exclusively so I migrated to it to keep interacting with people who have decided that they don't want to use Facebook anymore. And I bet that that's true for some of you too. Um, but these are examples of Instagram. This is an Instagram kind of show and tell of a book that someone was reading that they thought was good. This was a, an image that somebody saw that they thought deserved sharing. This was an event that a church held that um, they wanted people to know about. Okay, so if that's Facebook and Instagram, let's talk about Twitter. Twitter is where legislators are. So if you're if you're going to Twitter, you're you're going not so much to share or to promote or something like that. You're you're going there to provide a piece of information to somebody that you want to have have that information might be legislators, might be the media, might be colleagues, might be opponents, but you're telling information and you're putting your, uh, putting your name behind it. So the thing you don't want to do on Twitter is get it wrong. So these are examples of what Twitter looks like. And I'm, I, some of you probably have Twitter and some of you don't by the end of this, uh, presentation. Hopefully many more of you will be planning to have a Twitter account if you don't already. Um, this is an example of a media advisory that Texas Impact put out one time. But the important thing about it is this was a direct message that I sent to a reporter. So one of the uses of Twitter would be to, to sort of poke an individual person to make sure they see something that you have put out in more general spaces elsewhere. Um, here's an example of uh, advocate, and some of you may know, um, our, our colleague in Environment Texas, uh, who's engaging, he's replying to a tweet that a legislator put out, correcting information about it, and um, then he's, he's trying to draw other people into that line of discussion not again to have a fight, but to alert people that this is this is um, a conversation thread that needs participation. This is an example of constituent engagement on Twitter uh, with Jeff Leach here. So here's a person who attended an event with Representative Jeff Leach, representative from North Texas, um, and he tweeted at the representative, the person who attended the event did subsequently, there may have been, I don't, I have no idea how many people were at that event. Maybe there were a hundred people there. Maybe there were 500 people there, but this person got that legislator's attention and the legislator responded back to him. That's important because later in the session, if that same guy says something else to that legislator on Twitter, the legislator will have kind of a memory and record that, oh, this is someone who's interacted with me before. They're at least a relatively engaged constituent. So I know that a lot of people are scared of Twitter and they're scared for various reasons. Some people are worried that it goes really fast. That's true. Twitter is just sort of popping all the time. Some people are worried that Twitter is a place where it's easy to get in trouble. That is, that's kind of true. Um, see my other comment about 
making sure that you say don't don't say stuff that's not true and check your facts before you put stuff on Twitter. The Twitter won't hurt you and I to to demonstrate how true that is, I'm going to um, show you I'm gonna I guess what I have to do is um, we're gonna take you to a a place on our YouTube channel um, sorry, this will be awkward for a second. Everyone's used to awkward program things on Zoom at this point. Um, so this is Texas Impact's YouTube channel. And this is a playlist called Advocacy 101, Twitter for Advocacy. Each of these videos is a little video about how to use Twitter specifically for civic engagement advocacy. I'm not gonna play them now. You can see how long they are. The first one is seven minutes. It's about setting up a Twitter account. It will walk you through every step of setting up the account from open your computer all the way to, and now you have a Twitter account. I would really encourage you to walk through these videos. The fourth one is a repeat of the first one. It's if you're trying to set it up on a phone instead of a computer. Um, but we we made these because I think a lot of times what trips people up is not uh, so much conceptual as super mechanical. They need to know exactly what button to push next. And that's what we're, um, that's what we're trying to provide here. So if you need uh, a tutorial on Twitter, some technical assistance to get yourself set up, I recommend um, I recommend our videos. And the the other thing I want to talk about about legislative engagement is district drop-offs or another thing that I want to talk about is district drop-offs. So uh, for people who, um, for legislators who are in the capital area, so in Travis County, their district office is in the capital. That's the only office they typically have. But for other legislators, they typically have an office in the capital and then one or two or maybe sometimes more offices out in their legislative district. And those offices can feel really remote from the Capitol. So if you're in the Capitol during a typical legislative session, not maybe currently, but most of the time, the Capitol's a kind of a hip happening place during the legislative session. It's a place where there's a lot of action all the time. Capitol staff are kind of constantly bombarded with different kinds of, of interactions. District staff, not so much. So district staff, a lot of times are responsible for dealing with constituent needs. So if a constituent, for example, needs help getting social security or something like that, the, the district staff probably help with that. Um, but they sometimes can feel kind of abandoned in the district office. You can really improve your relationship with the legislative office by making sure that the district office knows who you are. And that's true during COVID, even, even though you may not wanna schedule a long sit down meeting in a small office in a strip mall, which is where sometimes district offices are, um, you still should, should not ignore the staff in that district office. They're part of the legislators team, just like the people in the Capitol are. And then there's Zoom, um, which you all know how to use because we're all on it together right now. This is, um, Scott's gonna talk in the next hour about legislative engagement groups, but we started our biggest project of building legislative relationships last year, just at the exact moment when it would, had we only known, it would prove to be 
especially challenging for constituents to build legislative relationships because there weren't going to be able to be in-person visits. We've been really impressed with legislators' willingness to participate in Zoom meetings with constituents. And I would encourage you, don't, um, don't spend too much time wondering if it's a good idea to ask your legislator if they will Zoom with you. They probably will. So um, you're going to have Zoom meetings on Tuesday if you're participating in our legislative visits. And if not, Texas Impact staff are able to help you set them up at other times, or that you probably don't need anyone's help. You can set up a Zoom meeting with your legislator by yourself. 